want to give you a warning up front. I've meditated on this message for five years. And each part that I've meditated on, God has revealed something more to me. And it's like, God, you're so good. You're so good. I can't take any more. And he gives me more until tears come down. And I don't want to do that tonight. I practiced it with Rosemary last night, and there were times and times again that I had to quit and just thank God for what he has done. So I hope I can get that across tonight. I'm talking about benefits tonight. It was the very first message I heard when I went to Colorado. We sold everything, packed up, and moved to Colorado Springs to go to Karis Bible College. And somehow or other, we got our act together, and we were ready a week before school. So we went up to Karis to go to their healing school. Whether the school's in session or not, they open the school on Thursdays to the public, and they teach healing, they preach healing, and then they minister healing. And people get healed. They get healed every time. What do you think it would be like at your church if people got healed every time? In fact, they had their annual Healing is Here conference this last week up at Karis. 3,000 people were there, and by the second night, 1,000 people had gotten healed. By the end of the conference, there were people coming out of wheelchairs, people receiving their sight. There was even a dead baby raised from the dead. And it's amazing stuff. So we went up to Karis Bible College to see that first healing school back in 2014. And the director of healing school, Daniel Amstutz, was teaching a message that caught my imagination. He called it your benefits package. And that really got me. That's what I'm teaching on tonight, your benefits package. When you go to work for a new company, especially if it's a medium to large size company, they sign you up automatically for their benefits package. Health plan, vision plan, retirement plan. Like I said, it's often automatic, but if you don't know what your benefits are, if you don't know how to appropriate them, they don't do you any good. It's just as if they did not exist. If you don't know what your benefits are and you don't know how to appropriate them, they might as well not be there. But when you come into God's kingdom, you get an excellent benefits plan, a kingdom benefits plan. But it's just like your benefits from your employer. If you don't know what they are and you don't know how to take advantage of them, they don't do you any good. And that's important. If you don't know what your benefits are, and if you don't know how to take care of them, your benefits give you no benefit. I worked as a salaried employee for Newport News Shipbuilding for 31 years. And they had an excellent benefits package. When you work for a large company, it generally comes with a good benefits package. Two thirds of my health insurance was paid for by the company. I had a low price vision plan, a low price dental plan, low price life insurance, four weeks of vacation, 11 paid holidays, a good sick leave plan, 50% match in the 401k, and a retirement plan that would pay you up to 45% of your salary for the rest of your life. It was an excellent package. But your benefit package makes that pale in comparison. Your plan includes much, much more and it lasts for eternity. So you need to know its provisions and you need to take advantage of it. So I'm calling this message, Your Benefit Package. And it's based on Psalm 103 verses one to five, but it's gonna take me a while to get there. I'm gonna start in Psalm 107 verses 20 to 21. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Then I'm gonna to go to Mark 5.25 and the woman with the issue of blood. And then I'll circle around to Psalm 103 and go deep into the provisions of your benefit package. So first, Psalm 107. 
verse 20 to 21. It says, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. This idea is repeated four times in this psalm. Four cycles. Get in distress, call out to the Lord, he delivers them from their destructions, and they give thanks. Four times. It's important. God's trying to get something across. The psalm was most likely written after Judah returned from their exile in Babylon. They were in captivity because they completely turned from the Lord their God. Despite his repeated warnings, and he even was pleading with them not to turn away, but they did. They turned from him. They did detestable things. They worshipped idols. They did child sacrifices in the fire. In fact, that's described in Jeremiah 32, verse 35. It says, They built the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Himon to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Moloch, which I did not command them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination and cause Judah to sin. What they were doing is they made a stone statue to their god Moloch, looked something like a person. Its stomach was hollowed out. Their arms were up like this. And they'd build a raging fire between the legs that would come up through the stomach, heat the arms, and then they would take their children, put them on the arms so they would roll down into the fire and burn to death. It was an abomination. It was so evil. It was so against God's very nature that the all-knowing God couldn't conceive of it. So Jerusalem was attacked by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The walls were broken down. There was a long siege. The people nearly starved to death. The city was laid waste, and the people went into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And now, after 70 years, Persia overflow, overthrows Babylon. And Cyrus, the king of the Persians, releases the Jews. And they come back to a shattered country and they set about rebuilding it. So this psalm was especially applicable to that situation. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. In his amazing, awesome compassion and forgiveness, he sent his word and delivered them. If you've had an abortion, or some other sin you think God can never forgive you of. And his nearly inconceivable compassion, he sends his word and heals you and delivers you from your destructions. Just ask him. And this is amazing. 150 years before Cyrus became king of Persia, before he was ever born, God calls him out. In Isaiah chapter 44, he calls this pagan king by name, Cyrus, and he calls him his his shepherd. And the beautiful thing is before Judah ever had the need, God had made provision for them. He had made provision to call them back and heal. It's the same way with you. Jesus, by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. First Peter, 1 Peter 2.24. And that was done 2,000 years ago at the cross before you ever had the need. And this is important. You have already been healed. I pray you can get that by revelation. When sickness comes, you're not the sick trying to get healed. You're the healed fighting off sickness. And that is so different. It is like an army on the top of a mountain defending the high ground. The enemy can't get up from the valley. You ask any army, and they'd rather be on the high ground defending it than in the valley trying to get up. You're not in the valley trying to get sickness. You're on the high ground defending your healing. And when we read in Psalm 107, he sent his word. We often think it's his written word. 
He sent his written word and he healed them. But the Hebrew word here is much more. It's more like he spoke to the problem and cured it. And so he delivered them. And the response is, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and his wonders to the sons of men. Who else spoke to problems and they were cured? Jesus, he is the word made flesh. He spoke to diseases and they were healed. He spoke to demons and they flee. He spoke to the storms and they were still. The new covenant's a better covenant built on better promises and Jesus is the word. He was sent by the Father and he teaches us how to heal and how to be healed. I want to look at a very special time when Jesus spoke and brought about a very special healing. And he wants to do the same for you. The woman with the issue of blood. If you turn with me to Mark 5, verse 25. This woman had a problem. To put it in more modern terms, she had a hemorrhage. And to read the verses, verse 25 to 34. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and endure, endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all she had but was not helped at all but had rather grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will be well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that power proceeded from him and had gone forth, he turned around to the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to, me, said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Now this is often taught that Jesus sought out the woman to reassure her about her healing. But it is so much more than that. In verse 25, this is a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years long years she was unclean by old covenant law everything she touched was unclean basically she was isolated from all people because of her affliction for 12 years mark says she had endured much at the hands of many physicians spent all that she had and was not helped at all but rather had grown worse so she was destitute on top of it and getting worse physically Think of that suffering. Her hopes for a cure are repeatedly crushed. She spent all she had trying to get help. Instead, she grew worse. Now she's sick, isolated, and, and impoverished. When you read the account in Luke, by comparison, it's almost funny. Luke is the beloved physician, as Paul describes him. And he drops all this information about doctors. He simply says, she couldn't be healed by anyone. They both get the truth across, just Luke's not gonna blame doctors. Mark and Luke are correct, just with different perceptions. So the woman thought, or more properly, in the Greek, she was saying to herself, she was speaking to herself. That's important. She said to herself, if she could touch his clothes, she would be healed. Now, where did she get that idea? It's because she heard about Jesus. Again, the spoken word. Faith comes by hearing. And she knew this man was a man of power. And when she hears the spoken word about Jesus, it brought about faith in her. And she said to herself, again, the spoken word. She said to herself, if I can touch his garment, I will be healed. 
The word here for heal is the Greek word sozo. It appears 123 times in the New Testament. And every time you read the word save or saved in the New Testament, it's referring to, and it's referring to salvation, the word behind it is sozo. 16 other times it's translated healed. It also means delivered, rescued. It's a word that impacts your entire being, spirit, soul, and body. This woman believed she would be sozo. So she came up in the crowd and touched Jesus' garment. She was all in on this. She didn't hold anything back. How do I know? Because she put herself at great risk if she failed. She was unclean, therefore by the law of Moses, she was not supposed to be in a crowd. Everything and every person she touched would become unclean. And as she touched someone who then went into the temple, she defiled the temple itself. And by law, she could be put to death. In fact, she should be put to death. She was risking everything. And she touched the hem of her garment, and she felt in her body that she was healed. But this is a different Greek word. It's not sozo. It's pronounced something like Ia omahi, and it means cured, as in her body was made well. And Jesus perceived that power had gone out of him. And King James says virtue, but the Greek word is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. Mighty, miracle, working power. That's what the word means. This is interesting. Jesus didn't send it out. She drew it out of him. You know, you can do the same thing. I can tell you from experience, when someone comes to be healed and we're praying for them, they can draw that power out. Those people are easy to heal because they draw the power of Jesus that's on the inside of you. So Jesus was determined to find out who did this thing? Who drew that power out? Why would he care? Well, when she comes to him and admits what she has done, the first thing he does is call her daughter. I love this. She's a child of the living God. Somehow here before the cross, Jesus calls her daughter, makes her part of God's family. And he tells her, your faith has healed you. And that word is sozo. Saved, healed, delivered, rescued. Jesus wanted to make sure that she got the entire benefits package, not just the physical healing. And it just gets better. The verb tense used here in sozo is the perfect tense. What it means is her condition is permanent. And then Jesus tells her to go in peace. And the Greek here literally means go into peace. She had a new and wonderful door opening for her in her healing. There was her choice. She could go into peace if she chose to. God's peace is there. You need to choose to walk in his peace. And finally, Jesus tells her, be healed of your affliction. And the verb here is another one for physical healing. And it's in the present imperative tense. It means be continuously whole or continuously sound in body. She believed for Sozo, and Jesus made sure she didn't settle for anything less. He gave her Sozo, saved, healed, delivered, rescued. She got the whole benefits package from the living God. And it's the same for you. Jesus wants to give you the whole benefits package. You just really need to know, really know what that benefit package is and he is more than willing to give it.
sign up for it and appropriate it by faith. You know, faith appropriates what's already been given by grace. Your faith doesn't make God do anything. He's already done it at the cross. That'll change your life if you get a revelation of it. The shipyard provided me with an excellent benefits package, but if I didn't appropriate that package, if I didn't take advantage of it, it wouldn't do me any good at all. You need to know your benefits package and that it's already provided by an awesome, grace-filled God and appropriated by faith. So with all that, let's look at your benefits package. Psalm 103, verse 1 to 5. And it reads as follows. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. First, David commands himself to bless the Lord. He commands his whole being, everything that is within him, to bless the Lord. Why would he do that? Because he'd taken his mind, his focus off the Lord. He had put his focus on his worldly problems. And now he's directing himself, in spite of those problems, to put his focus on the Lord. We need to do that all the time. Our five senses are always pulling at us, especially if we're hurting. We need to listen to our spirit, because our spirit is one with God's. We need to put our focus on the Lord. So what does bless mean? The Hebrew means to praise, to adore, with a strong undertone of affection. Do you have affection for your God? That was shocking to me when I first understood it, to be affectionate with my God, the creator of everything. That changes everything. You know what blesses me as a father? It's the fact that our kids want Rosemary and I in their lives. They want us to be involved with them. I think that blesses God too. When you want him involved in every aspect of your life, that blesses him. And David says, forget none of his benefits. He doesn't say bless the Lord because of his benefits. He doesn't say bless the Lord or don't forget his benefits. This is not a because or an or, it's an and. I think David is saying part of blessing the Lord is to remember his benefits. Remember all the things that he's provided to you out of his love and grace. Remember his benefits. It blesses him when you do that. Remembering his benefits, all of them, goes hand in hand with blessing him. And what are his benefits? Verse 3, he pardons all your iniquities. The King James Version says, forgiveth. The New American Standard says pardon, and both meanings are in the Hebrew, but I really like pardon. The one who receives a pardon has their slate wiped clean, as if the infraction never occurred. I think that's the right meaning here, because if you drop down to verse 12, it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? It's as far as they can possibly be. What the, how does the east relate to the west? They don't. They have nothing to do with each other. They have nothing in common. That's the great good news. In God's eyes, you and your sin have nothing to do with each other. You and your sin are not related. That is great news. It is incredible grace. 
And so many people look at that kind of grace and they shy away from it. They think it'll just encourage sin. God, it's not true. Paul tells us in Romans 2, 4, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? It's the kind of God, kindness of God that leads us to repentance, not the anger of God. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, that the love of Christ controls us or constrains us, as it says in the King James Version. It's his love that changes you. If you really wrap your mind around the fact that God has removed your sin so far from you that you aren't even related to it, if you start understanding all the implications of that, it will change you. It'll change the way you behave for the better. What can you do in the face of that kind of love but embrace it and follow it? And it keeps getting better. The very next thing is he heals all your diseases. First, he forgives all your sin. He paid for them at the cross. And that enables him to reestablish relationship with you. And that enables you to reestablish relationship with him. And healing comes out of that relationship. And it still gets better. Verse 4. He redeems your life from the pit or from destruction. He's saying that death is not the final word over you. He has redeemed you for all eternity. And then it says he crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. The Hebrew word for crown here means two things. First, and simply, it means he put a crown on us. A crown is a symbol of authority. Way back in the beginning, in Genesis, he told Adam and Eve to have dominion over the world and over every living thing. And he's reestablishing it here. He's telling you, have authority. You have authority over sickness. You have authority over the evil one. Exercise it. Tell that sickness to go. Tell the evil one to get out. The second thing that word means, crown, the Hebrew behind it, means to surround or encircle. He surrounds you, encircles you with loving kindness and compassion. Just like the father surrounded the son, the prodigal son. You remember the story. The prodigal took his inheritance early, went off and spent it on riotous living, spent all he had, went broke, lost all his friends, and to survive, he fed and served pigs, the very lowest job a Hebrew could have. When he finally came to his senses, he said, yeah, I'm better off in my father's home as a servant. And he turns and comes back to the father, and the father, when he sees him a long way off, Before he could say anything, remember the prodigal had rehearsed what he was going to say. I've sinned against you. I've done bad things if you'd only accept me. Before he could say a word, the father, knowing he had turned, ran to him and encircled him with loving kindness and compassion. It was as if the son had never wasted his inheritance and it was all back. That's what God wants to do for you. In verse 11, David says, For as high as the heavens, this is a song, back in the psalm, For as high as the heavens are above all the earth, so great is his loving kindness for those who fear him. The heavens were the greatest distance away that David could think of. He had nothing that described a greater distance. So he uses that to compare to the loving kindness of God. It was so great, so intense. It's the only thing David could come up with to compare that intensity. We don't deserve that kind of love. It's beyond our comprehension. In fact, in Ephesians 3, Paul says, in fact, he prays for divine revelation for you. 
for the power of God to strengthen you so that you will be able to comprehend the breadth and length and depth and height of God's love. It takes divine empowerment to begin to understand his love. But whether you do or not, it's there. That's his love for you. It's part of and the basis of his wonderful benefits package. Again, as soon as the prodigal son's father could see that the son had turned back home, before the son could say one word, the father ran and enveloped him in his arms, in arms of love. I just want to repeat what the son had done in squandering his benefits made no difference to the father. That's how God feels about you. Just let him embrace you with his arms of love right now. And this might be the best one, verse 5. It reads a little different in the New American Standard than in the King James, but I think the New American Standard gets the idioms of the Hebrew a little better. It reads, Who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. What is better than being satisfied? God could fill your years with good things and you not be satisfied. He knows exactly what will satisfy you. He knows what those good things are and he gives it. He pardons you as if you had never sinned. He heals you. He redeems you from the pit. He crowns you with the crown of authority. He envelops you with loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies you. He gives you contentment. That's his benefit package. Take advantage of it because your benefit package has a wonderful effect. It says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You know, our culture tells us, turn 40 and you've got to slow down. Turn 50 and you just can't do what you used to do. Turn 60 and it's time to retire. Turn 70 and it's time to get your affairs in order. Well, God says he gives you this wonderful benefits package so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. You don't believe it? Don't worry. It won't work for you. It works by faith. But Moses, under the old covenant, an inferior covenant, he lived to be 120 years old, and at 120, on his very last day of life, he climbed Mount Nebo. He climbed a mountain. In Deuteronomy 34, 7, it says, Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eyes were not dim, nor his natural force abated. That's what I'm aiming for. If I aim at the stars and hit the moon, I've still done pretty well. And I've done a whole lot better than the person who aimed at nothing. Aim at nothing. And you're sure to hit it. Aim at something. You and I are under a better covenant based on better promises. All of Psalm 103 is under the old covenant. And every benefit is listed in the present tense. God forgives your sin. He heals your disease. He redeems you from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. He satisfies your life. You know what the new covenant does to that? It all becomes past tense. It's already accomplished for you at the cross. You can count on it. You just have to walk in it. He forgave your sins at the cross. By your stripes, you have been healed, 1 Peter 2.24. You were redeemed at the cross. Your authority has been restored to you, and you are greatly loved. If you know all that, you can't help but be satisfied. Good things are already laid out before you. Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
You know, you walk uprightly. You know how I know? God has made you righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He, God, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Psalm 107, verse 20 and 21. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. God has sent his word for you. In fact, his spirit is in you if you know him. Give thanks for what God has already done. And just like the woman with the issue of blood, God is not satisfied until you get the whole the whole benefits package. If you're believing for sozo, saved, healed, delivered, rescued, he wants you sozo. Let him do it. Know your benefits and take advantage of them. He has pardoned you. There is no condemnation. God is not mad at you. As one of my instructors used to say, <laughs> he's not even in a bad mood. In God's eyes, you aren't even related to your sin, just like the East is not related to the West. He's healed you. Grab your healing. Defend it from sickness. Healing is yours. Don't give it away. He's redeemed you from the pit. Your eternity is secure. He has restored the authority that Adam had over the world to you. You need to exercise it. He surrounds you with loving kindness and compassion. The God of the universe loves you so much that it takes a revelation just to grasp it. Let God love you and envelop you in his arms. He satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Because God's word is for that. Believe God's word and not the word of the world. Aim for the stars. So let me pray for you. God, help us know and receive the tremendous benefit package you have prepared for us. Open our hearts and our eyes to you and to your promises. And as Psalm 107 says, let us give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Thank you, Jesus. If any of you need to know the Lord, we're happy to pray for you. One of the things to, to believe this benefit package, to grab onto the power of it, is the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. That is simple and easy. We can pray for you for that. And if you need healing, we're certainly wanting to pray for you for that. He sent his word and healed and delivered you from your destructions. Amen.